Welcome to the Ink Pulp Podcast. This is the first time I'm uh, saying that title because I just changed it. So today I have a very specific topic of discussion. Uh, we'll cover more of life with the coronavirus, but we're going to talk about the Lost Boys movie today because uh, these fellas are, are fanatics and I found that out online and I grew up with much love for this movie. So I'm excited to talk about that. So today with me, I've got uh, Carl Kershaw's here. Say hi, Carl. Yeah. Hi. Hello. <laughs> and I've got Andy. Andy, do you say your name Belanger? Is yeah. That... Okay. Welcome That's... aboard, Michaels. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so as you can see, Carl's in his studio <laughs> at home, right, Carl? That's right. Yeah. That's and Andy, you are. Where are you? <laughs> I'm. I'm. I'm hiding out in, in an old dilapidated cottage, building a recurve bow. <laughs> to hunt are you, vampires. Are you planning for the apocalypse? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready to hunt vampires. <laughs> I right. feel like the grandpa in Lost Boys right now. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, so I'm gonna switch the camera. Um, so, oh, let me talk about what we're working on. So I'm gonna be inking this, um, let me pull it up, this drawing. I did of Keanu Reeves, or not Keanu Reeves, what am I saying? Uh, Kiefer Sutherland. Yeah, you're in, uh, you're fired Los from the Lost Lost Boys <laughs> Club. You're out. I, look, I, I have love for the movie. I can't claim to be a fanatic fan like you guys are. Um, but so I'm going to be inking that, and Carl's working on your mini comic, or what are you Yeah. Doing? So. Um, but I just got your file, so I might try inking this also. Okay, um, cool. That'd be awesome thing. to see. And Andy's building a boat. I'm building a boat, and I'm also working on a war comic right now before I go full three months into Mother Trucker. Um, let me just find a, a quick... Uh... So Mother Trucker, that's, is that another TKO book? No, no, this is my own thing. And you're gonna, how, do you know how you're gonna put that out? Yeah, I'm gonna kickstart it. Okay, all right, actually, I'll, let me get to my table because that's a good place to start. You show your shit, um, yeah. I'm gonna walk over to my table. So Andy, have you given thought to how, like you're gonna kickstart it, but what are you kickstarting? I'm gonna kickstart the first issue. So you're gonna publish floppies? Yeah, I'm gonna publish floppies and they'll be thicker, like 30 page floppies. And then uh, uh, I'll do some sort of trade thing after. So I don't know whether I'll go with a publisher after for the trade or maybe I'll kickstart the trade. I don't know what I'll do. So this is the war right now. I don't know if you guys can see that. It's got oh, some yeah. chopper action. That's cool. Oh, it's like modern war. For some reason, I was picturing like period. No, it's modern. Okay. It's, it's going into a true war stories anthology. And then... Uh, Where is that anthology being published? I, I forget who she said was publishing it, but it's going into the big book market. It's not in the comic book market. Okay. Um, Alex the, the Campy hired me for that. And this is the first image of Mother Trucker I got going on. It's monochromatic, it hasn't been colored. But my buddy uh, Tato, who does my heavy metal stuff, is gonna color it. And I just got a logo made. It might be backwards, but super 80s. Yeah, that's so much. That's I, saw you, I saw you post online about needing an 80s logo. I loved all the like inspiration you pulled for that. Yeah, I'm super, super pumped about this uh, this logo action. Dreads 13 out of Orlando's doing it. 
but like here's some of the logos that he was designing i don't know if this is backwards it's probably backwards in the thing no, but uh it's showing up okay for me oh okay these are the logos that he just designed dreads 13 on instagram he's just like amazing dude yeah those are great those are great yeah so let's i guess first guys let's talk about um this lockdown we're living under how, how are you all doing um i'm doing okay i've i've i don't know like as oops, there goes most of my artwork um as i think as a lot of people have mentioned it's it's like it hasn't been a big change for a lot of uh, introverted artists except that um you know, I've got more family around and it's hard to find productive hours. So a lot less work is getting done, but um, it's nice to be spending more time with the family. Like it, like everyone's kind of, it's, it's sort of like, like a, like a, a kind of a vacation filled with existential dread. Right. You know? <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. So, uh, uh, so it's affected you in terms of like emotionally it's, it's a lot to the, it's a heavy, heavy weight on a daily basis, I think. Yeah, it is. I mean, just because the smallest tasks are, are, are now complicated and terrifying, like going, just going, like we spend a lot of time going outside for, I take the kids for bike rides and walks, but it's so, you know, there's like a, there's a, there's a low level stress to that too, because you're, yeah you're just trying to distance from people and like, make sure they, like the, the kids, I mean, they get it, but also like they're, you know, they're not aware half the time of where, you know, where they are in relation to other people. So it's like, this right. Constant. How old are your kids, Carl? They're um, almost seven and nine. Oh, yeah. So okay. Pretty good. Yeah, they're young, but I mean, they're, they're, you know, with it enough that they, yeah, that they understand true. what's happening. So, right. I have a two and a half year old and they, she, uh, she has no idea what's going on besides the fact she doesn't get to hang out with her friends and she's got to stay home the whole time. Oh, that's uh, awesome. But I like, like I was telling you about, oh, look at this recurve bow, brand new, nice. Um, what I was saying is, uh, yeah, my, one of my buddies that I rolled with in high school, we were like inseparable for six, seven years, died two weeks ago from COVID. I hadn't seen him in 15 years or whatever, but he, uh, yeah, he was, he was a little overweight, I think, and he had type 2 diabetes, but uh, yeah, he passed away two weeks from the, ago from this craziness, so. Did you know he had it, or you just found out he had passed away? I found out that he passed away. He lived in my hometown, and I haven't been back there in, in like, years. My dad still lives there. But my mom actually phoned me and told me, and then all my friends from high school started Hi. started coming. Come here, come here, baby. Come here. Is that me a danger? Yeah, that's me a danger running around. <laughs> come on, daddy. I'm I'm talking to some guys over here, Mia. Oh, it's the talking. Yeah, it's the talking. So yeah, I, I, then it was like just you know a few days of me connecting with guys from high school over it, and uh, it was pretty good. Say hi. Hi, Mia. Mia. How you doing? How are you doing, Mia? There's Carl. Mia, have you been in my studio chair? Yeah. You've been using yeah. my chair? Yeah, and playing with your toys. Playing with my toys. Yeah, she's got your Gundams. She's been, she's been <laughs> wrecking your Gundams. <laughs> you can play with those Gundams. Yeah, okay, go get some toes. Okay. Okay, have fun. Uh, the old toast distraction. <laughs> yeah, the old, the old toast. Papa. <laughs> Papa, mommy. So, yeah. Andy, Papa. Have, Papa. what's up? Has it affected uh, you in, in other ways also? Yeah, it's hard to get work done for sure. Well, yeah, the, like the other I, thing we too on a is... big, yeah, we were on a big animation gig for a few weeks there. And then uh, once that, that was like some of the hardest work I've done in a long time. It was about two and a half months of 20 hour days. Holy shit. Uh, seven days a week for about two and a half months to get this animation gig out the door. And then once that ended around my birthday, around March 30, um, 
you know, I hadn't even noticed the, the quarantine at that point because I was working so much. But then after that, uh, you know, I've got this war comic and I, I've been getting commissions like crazy. I've never gotten this many commissions in my life. Yeah, same here. That's been a... a it's wild. A it's wild. Hey, Mia, stop doing that. I need to go away. I have to. Yeah, I know it sounds cool, but whatever. So, yeah, so, but trying to get motivated has been really yeah. difficult, you know, running around with a two-year-old and all the rest of that, but I get to go to the studio a lot. Carl and I have a studio, but I live like two blocks away, and I'm the only one with keys, so I get to go play around in there with Mia, and on the days Sylvia looks after Mia, I get to go and draw in there. It's pretty fun. Yeah, I've, I've been at home pretty much for a month and a half, so... I can't, uh, I can't go to the studio. But you know what, one thing it's affected significantly is just the, obviously the, like the, uh, the workflow, the production flow of comics. So, cause we finished up, we finished up our second volume of, uh, of right before this happened and it was supposed to go to the printer. Uh, and then every, everything just got, uh, I didn't hear what you said, Carl. Your second volume of what? Okay. The second volume of Isola was wrapped up and ready to go to the printer, and then production just shut down. So there's just a bunch of files sitting on a server somewhere, and, uh, and, and so yeah, I still don't know that, when that's going to come out. That's why, Andy, I was asking about self-publishing floppies. I mean, this is really maybe like think about proper the business the the business of, of publishing in comics and the, the direct distribution market and all that jazz. I was just wondering if that had well, thoughts on anything. I, I think the idea of publishing floppies through a publisher right now seems silly. Right. Or or absolutely pop publishing them on a monthly schedule. Like there's oh, just no there's no need if you're doing your own independent book and you can uh, right. You guys had any uh, financial impact from this? Not yet, but it's kind of like you know I had enough stuff going on that I was that that I'm okay, but um, I don't know how long that can last. Like we'll see. Right. Yeah, I had that that animation gig, and uh, the the. Uh, the video, the money you make in video games is just like so much more than comics. So uh, yeah, it was like we got kind of set up before this all started. Um, and then, but I mean, the government, because comics is completely shut down, the stores are shut down, distribution shut down. Um, I'm eligible for the government assistance, and the government's given me like forty seven hundred bucks already. Oh, wow. That's great. That's great. What about you, Carl? Have you taken any of that? I didn't yet. I didn't apply. I looked at it and I qualify for it, but I didn't apply for it because I, my wife and I talked about it and we thought like, we don't, we're okay right now, but, uh, and I didn't want to kind of burden the system more than necessary. But then my, my dad called me super concerned and said, you know, you should maybe, you should maybe take this because one way or another, you're going to be paying for it. Like it, when, oh, when, right. when we're in this massive deficit and uh, taxes increase to cover it. Um, That's, a good point. That's so what I, I was thinking. Yeah, and I'm I was gonna, also thinking like, you know, what happens if I don't get paid in full for my animation gig? What happens if like stuff really hits the fan? You know what I mean? So I was like, if I'm eligible, I'm going to go for it. You know, and mm -hmm. just I'm I'm not spending it. I'm just hanging on to it for now. Um, you know, it's not like I'm loaded, but it's a, uh, you know, it, it it's a, a a thing, and it all it all go back to them anyway. <laughs> right, yeah, right. <laughs> They're gonna get it back anyway. So, um, here's my uh, here's my Sean Crystal inking so far. I'm inking this. Hold on, I'm gonna walk face. over and see. Oh, cool. What what app are you using, Carl? Clip Studio. Yeah. I, I basically do everything with it. When I work digitally, which is where I used to. Yeah, I really love it. I mean, it's uh, it's obviously it's like 
it's easier to use on uh, on the desktop, but um, but I've been doing everything on an iPad, and it's kind of like you know there's some problems with you don't have as quick access to keyboard shortcuts and things, but it's fine. Like right. I've gotten I've gotten used to it, so I'm pretty yeah, productive. I've never used it on the uh, iPad. I was curious about that. It's great. It's like it's basically exactly the same. Um, and I successfully strung my bow. First time, right? Yeah, First time ever stringing this, a bow. Like, it comes with this like separate string thing that you, you connect to the end and you pull on the neck. And you can get it in there. And I gave it a few twists to get a few extra pounds of pressure. So you're there we go. up in the, in the country, Andy? Yeah, I'm up in the country right now. Like when you say uh, Sylvia's Sylvia's dad owns a place, and it's it's you know there's no one around, so right. it's uh, not like you, and we what I do is we get food and gas and everything around our house, so we don't yeah. even enter the communities. Like we don't even go in there. So are you weathering up the quarantine up there? No, 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 no. It's only about half hour, forty five minutes from our house. Oh, okay. So yeah, maybe more than forty-five minute drive. So I'll I'll drive home later in the day. Gotcha, gotcha. So yeah. um, and when you say country, what does that mean? Like, where are you? Um, I guess I'm like southwest of Montreal. I I you know, and there's a town nearby called Huntington. Okay. Yeah, it's like all small towns, and then where I am, I'm just full on in the country. I got you. That's awesome. Yeah. But I mean, it, it's kind of like, uh, you know, there's not running water or, or like a lot of electricity and stuff up here. Uh huh. So it's only kind of like a place to come hang out for the day in the country. So I'm setting up like a full archery range up here. Oh, cool. Today. And uh, yeah, when my wife wanna comes up here, come up here with the baby and garden, I can just come up here and shoot arrows and, and draw and stuff like that. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, wrestling, I think, is totally finished for like a year. My the guys that I work with who are wrestlers, they all want to get right back into it, and I'm like, without a vaccine, how do you guys expect to wrestle? Like, WWE tests people like every week. Like, you know, there's no fans in the audience. Like, right. Without fans, these guys don't make money. And I was like, hey, what fans are gonna want to come to this? And B, like, do I want to get in a wrestling match and I get a body slam from a guy and it comes with like a virus that kills my grandma, you know, right, like, right. <laughs> or my mom, you know? So mm -hmm. it's, it's just I, like, even if they were to get started, like in August or September, I don't know that I'd participate. Right. I'm probably yeah, going to waste. I guess I hadn't thought about wrestling, but I mean, Comic Con for sure. I, I don't, I can't, I don't know how we get back to those right now. Like well, were they like, how were, were they valuable to you, to your, your, your yearly income? Yeah, I mean, I, like, I'm not really getting freelance work these days. So the bulk of my income has been conventions and, my in all like I didn't take any jobs or, or line anything up for March or April because I was going to be traveling so much with cons. So mm. when they canceled everything, I just saw all my income just vanish. Oh, so that and you can so when you Sean, when you're doing commissions now, does all that stuff go through sequential? Yeah, yeah. Like I am, um, Jason. Like when the cons are canceled. <clears throat> my uh, art dealer Jason decided like it, like quickly he created this thing called Essentially Sequestered mm -hmm. it was like a streaming version of a con for us not where we set up but we just opened up our commission list and we, we would all get time slots and hop on and we would just work on our commissions while we were chatting with each other and That's he cool. would field questions from our audience and in doing that, more people would come out and would get more commissions. So I lined up a good bit from that. Yeah. And I, I'm working my way through those. I right. guess Kerry's doing the same thing, right? And yeah. 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 But he hasn't been on the stream, but yeah, he opened up his, his commissions. 
I talked to Carrie all day. I don't think Carrie knows how to stream. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I love got him. him on, I got him on FaceTime not too long ago. <laughs> but yeah, he's not the most computer uh, savvy no. guy in the world. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, Carl, how do you make like the most of your in your like income where does that come from um it's it's come mostly from um from the the image stuff like basically all i've been doing is uh is working on on isola like uh for the last two years with the occasional cover here and there for marvel or dc uh or um i had like w like one or two side gigs that were just like illustration gigs like i did like a dungeons and dragons book cover and um oh. some other thing so you know those are i can do fairly quickly and they pay okay but most of the income is just from um it's just from the, the image book but i'll tell you like i don't know what's going to happen this year for that because right. I, as as you know like we get our statements and andy knows like when we when you see the statements come in from your your um your image sales month to month i mean like unless you're saga or something, then those are just kind of dropping. Like I watched it go from like, I think we launched at like 24,000 or something like that. And then now it's kind of hovering around the last issue 10 was, oh, there's my son. Hi. What's up champ? How are you doing brother? What's going issue on 10 here? was like around like between 10 and 12,000. And I just have to imagine with like, whatever happens when, when we come out of this with, with retail, like that's going to dip even more. So we're like, we're not in the red. So my, my, you know, my goal with the issues is really just, we like, we want to be able to afford to pay Michelle and Aditya for coloring and lettering. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't think about that. Oh, what, oh these are so the issue 10 dip, that was just the normal dip before the virus hit. Yeah. Well, and it wasn't like, it was like a steady, drop to, right, to that you right. know like from issue one to issue 10 it was just like just a little bit of a of a drop each time um and and you we've been conscious of it from the get-go like like what do we do when this is not sustainable anymore and um we've been talking about crowdfunding going straight to trades um uh -huh. like right now those issues all they like i love you know i love that people like them but like right now they're just to you know, pay our pay our like for the production of it. Right, right. Our actual money on that came from like the reason I can stay afloat is because we we handled our own. And I would recommend this to anyone who's doing an image book is um, is like deal with like handle your own foreign rights stuff. Oh right, yeah. Because I, I heard that image was getting like hard to deal with in that regard in terms of maintaining your, your well i don't know if they're hard to i think they're they're probably amenable to whatever it's just it was very difficult to know what the, the situation was right you know like there wasn't a lot of information about it so we like i know they have there there was um well andy you'd know more about this than i do like when you did southern cross there was someone there just handling foreign rights Correct. Yeah, they had a lady there that was doing it, but like we sold our book and it, it's out in France and it's in French, but I never saw a dime of that money. I think we were supposed to get 5,000 bucks and we just never saw it. So I don't know whether it just went into image to go against like money we owed or I don't yeah, know what it's, happened. It's that. possible that just it just got accounted for. for yeah, but yeah, I didn't I didn't see it in my curios, but maybe I just wasn't looking hard enough, but that five grand they were supposed to pay us. Uh, I don't know where that went. Anyway. Yeah. So we, we did, we handled our own, we made a deal with uh, uh, Dargo. It was like a, um, an offshoot called urban comics and they, they pick up a lot. Yeah, of, uh, urban. yeah. So urban picked up our book and then they have it for basically the world outside of uh, English. <laughs> right. So then they'll, they'll um, sort of sub sell it to uh to other like for example they they um, sold the rights for to um to bow to do it in italian and another publisher to do it in german oh cool 
And so they, you know, we got an advance for that. So that like, fortunately for us, we could, you know, we can continue to work on this thing because of that. All right. So well, uh, I, I'm going to have to bail soon, boys, but why don't we chat a little bit about some Lost Boys? Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say that. So I, I was on Instagram and I saw that Andy had posted a, uh, a poster of the saxophone player from the Lost Boys. <laughs> and I was like, cool. And then he said, Carl got that for me. We're fanatics. And I was like, this would be fun to talk about. Yeah, well, it's basically what we do every day. <laughs> so talk to me about your love of Lost Boys. <laughs> Where do we start? Where do you start? I, I think is it is it is it uh oh man, where do you start? I don't know. Like I well, Sean, I mean maybe you is should it start all about as, a, Marvel's as a jacket? A, no, as a guy who's who like there's something there's something lovable. It's not just nostalgia, I think, right? It's no, no, it's not. Because I I maintain that that script holds up today. Like it's pretty tight. I mean it's pretty clever and it had it had a great cast. And it was also a really good take on the vampire lore. Yeah, like the whole Peter Pan thing is a really fun twist. On right, it. right. So yeah, I mean, as a kid, it felt like a, um, like when I first saw it, I think what I really enjoyed about it was it felt like, it, it wasn't like talking down to a younger audience. Uh, it, it was, it made vampires like, they were like I saw them as like hip and cool, and I saw and they made the town of Santa Cruz this like really mm. eclectic, strange place, and mm. uh, it had a, a vibe to it that uh, at the time I, it just hit me. Like it that was, movie, that movie for me is like a warm blanket. It's like watching that movie reminds me of my childhood. Reminds me how many times I've seen it, which is like a thousand at least, and like. I even so it, went so it is nostalgia. Cruz. Yeah, it's, it is pure nostalgia, but I mean, I was into it when it came out. But I mean, I, I went to Santa Cruz in my 20s just because it was shot there so that I could walk on the boardwalk and walk around and that kind of stuff. It was, it was really, really cool. And I think the other thing with Lost Boys that we're forgetting, which is probably why we're all into it so much, is like the Frog Brothers owned a comic book store. Right, that was yeah. they were yeah. They were in that comic book store and there's that great scene where those goofs like steal a bunch of comics and then the guy and his girlfriend are in their car reading like Sad Sack and all these other like yeah. funny old comics and then they, the, the roof comes off and they get eaten. Right, right. And uh, I think there was just a heavy comic book, uh, uh, you know, vibe to that movie that like also when you're a kid growing up and you want to be a comic artist, you're just like really into it. Like I remember when Chasing Amy came out, I was really into it because they were comic book artists. Right, that's true. Yeah, it definitely romanticized that, that comic culture, I think. I mean, uh, the fact that those guys ran a store. Yeah, They're yeah. Always talking about Superman issues. Like, that was, that was super cool. And I like, I remember as a kid, like, find, like, figuring out that the, like, who the head vampire was, and I loved that he was, like, this nerdy old guy. <laughs> it was like the lead like he was the opposite of the lost boys where like they were like these kind of like hardened cool like beach cats yeah there was a real yeah. there's a real carnival kind of vibe to it too yeah that was really neat like all those like i i remember after that i had a real a real interest in like like just boardwalk boardwalk arcade kind of culture like it's like seaside Yes. Yeah. That you know that that was a big part of me enjoying it too. Is because I grew up going to boardwalks and beaches for for a week of every summer. So I understood that culture, mm -hmm. and, and I really yeah. understood that. And I love the idea that that kid was gonna live there. I was like, oh, how lucky is he? Yeah. In yeah. Ontario, we had two really good ones called Sobble and Wasaga, and uh, with Sobble Beach and Wasaga Beach, and I remember being 16 and during May 2-4, we'd all just go off together with no parents and party all weekend. And it was all boardwalks and, you know, you'd be a 16-year-old kid drunk, smoking weed for the first time, wandering down the boardwalks, going down, going on rides like the Gravitron and all that kind of 
fun stuff and then going to the beach and like going you know trying to meet girls and exactly all that stuff that and it just lost boys encapsulated that that part of growing up for me it's kind loved. of like it's kind of like our um our generation's version of like cruising culture right you know, like american graffiti like car cruising right yeah i can see that yeah and it also captured the summer love thing at the beach like with michael falling wasn't that his name michael yeah michael yeah, yeah. He fell in love with Star, was that her name? Yeah. Yeah, I remember all this. Um, Jamie Gertz was so hot in that movie. Yeah. yeah. I had a big crush on Jamie Gertz. What, what about the soundtrack at the time? Well, um, aside, the, like, the Lost in the Shadows, um, what I think, for me, as, like, part of that, like, even, like, after Lost Boys came out, and I would just put on, like, put on music to work to, um, it was part of like it was still like early '90s kind of goth era, right? Right. So, so "Cry Little Sister" kind of like fit in with all like all of like the Crow soundtrack, right? And Cure and all the shit that that I liked as an angsty <laughs> team. I still love that song. Yeah, I mean, for me, the soundtrack was like, oh, this is like alternative music. Like, this isn't your typical movie soundtrack and i remember that really got me too i still listen to uh i still believe all the time i mean we listen to that soundtrack in the studio all the time yeah but really like only like two or three tracks off of it yeah pretty much the rest is garbage yeah let's be honest yeah would you but would you say like where does this fall like in terms of like schumacher's filmography like it's got to be like one of the best things he's ever done yeah those are his those are his best movies is lost boys number one flatliners number two I don't think I mean, didn't he do another one like the big didn't he do another one like uh i think he's got i don't remember what it is but i think he's got one more film that's decent yeah oh i liked um i liked falling down oh that's oh, falling down yeah. was awesome yeah, yeah that movie's yeah. great surprisingly that is him Mm -hmm. I did enjoy that one. So yeah, I put that that up there with Lost Boys as probably my favorite ones he's done. And and I gotta say, Keeper Sutherland is probably like the coolest vampire ever. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Like I can't believe he like something hasn't come along where he reprised that role somehow. Yeah. But like definitely the coolest vampire of all time. And like his crew were like the coolest. Like it was just amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Well, yeah. also, I mean, like, it, I think for us, oh. for us, like, Lost Boys goes hand in hand with Young Guns and probably has a lot to do with, Dad. with Kiefer Sutherland. Yeah, he was the, I mean, for that generation, he was the coolest of the cool. Yeah. Sean, All right, gangsters, you, I'm going to go, go get okay. some food and I'm going to try out this bow. But uh, let's do this again in a week or two weeks or three weeks, whatever you want to do. We're not going anywhere. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good, brother. We'll definitely do that. Yeah, I'm going to go try out this bow and arrow. Yeah, and get someone to film the, your first attempt. Yeah, I will. All right, later, boys. Okay, right. see ya. Have a good one. Thank you, buddy. Sean, when I ink your work, it looks like, it looks like stealth freeze. All right, I gotta hold on. I can't see. Let me uh, just finish this one little area. Then I'm gonna look over and see what you're doing. That's an interesting. You know, I learned a lot from Stealth Reese. He spent a lot of time with me when I was developing. So oh yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. I don't know why I never made that connection before, but I can totally let me, see. Let me see. Hold on, I want to see. Hang on, I'll I'll share the screen. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what it is? It's it's the hard angular, mm -hmm. you know, wedges of everything. Yeah. I guess I, I've learned to soften it over the years through my. Yeah, I think because you you sort of you work so dry, like it kind of hides a lot of the right. the, the sharpness that that's inherent in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's what I think. I think is the case. Yeah. But I'm I'm using a I'm using a pencil tool. Are you really? 
Yeah, I use a pencil tool for everything, for all my finished lines. I just don't like, it's a 6B. I like that I like that it's got a bit of tooth, like yeah. it, uh, it got a bit like a bit of an organic it's quality to it. It's called 6B on Manga Studio? Yeah, oh. that's why I use it for everything. I don't think I've ever seen that one. I always use the rough pencil. Oh, no, actually, it's a, it's a Frendon brush. Oh. It's one of the Frendon brushes. Yeah, I, you know, I've never messed with like, second party brushes and I need to. I just don't work digitally that much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. What are you going to do? Cast a spell on something? Rick the Stamper. Oh, it's <laughs> it's got a wand. We're going, <laughs> we're reading a lot of Harry Potter stuff. Are you? That's, that's cool. What, which book are you on? We're on the last book now. We've been reading, um, like, kind of like, we're kind of averaging one book a year, just reading like a chapter at night. With oh, the kids. that's awesome. So we read a book, and then when we finish the book, we watch the movie. Oh, and, uh, that's cool. How are yeah. you liking the, uh, or how are the kids liking the, like, differences, the movie and the book? I think there's, like, I mean, they liked watching the movies, but I think there's some disappointment because there's a lot of stuff omitted. Right. So, I don't know. How do you like the movies? Oh, great. Do you like, a, like the books better or the movies? Mm. You like the movies better? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> what do I know? Rick to Sempra. Don't cast killing spells on people. No. Okay. <laughs> Do your kids draw, Carl? Yeah, like actually, they're they they would draw. Yeah, this is this is a drawing that Sean. This is Sean's up there on the screen. You can see him draw his, his inking. He drew this picture and I am inking and I'm going over it in the black, the black You're thicker line. You're supposed to draw it. Hmm? You're supposed to draw it. I am. Tired of drawing my own work. I'm going to draw somebody else's. <laughs> you could do one later. We'll send it to him. So can I color him? You can color it later, stuff? yeah. Yeah. See that. We'll send it to him, and that's what they're gonna use in the comic. Okay, I don't think this is going in a comic though. It's just for fun. Yeah, we're just having fun today. Okay. Anyway, I haven't watched The Lost Boys in a long time. I bought it on Blu-ray. Um, it was super cheap. Around, around Halloween, it was airing, I think on HBO or something, and I was all excited and kept putting it on for my kids, and they're older, and my daughter's 17, she doing? and uh, the son's 14, and they're just like, yeah, this is really bad. Really? Yeah, I was like, oh, oh. awesome. Oh, well, I guess that's, I mean, like, it's impossible for me to be objective about it, I guess. Like, uh, to me, it feels like it's, I don't know, it, like it holds up. Like, I mean, we've been watching a lot of old, like 80s movies with the kids lately. And like we watched, what did we watch? We watched Back to the Future. Um, we watched the original Ghostbusters. We watched a bunch of stuff and it and they're super into them. Like I, I thought they'd- Yeah, yeah, they'd yeah. Them. Those are great. I mean, those, whole, my kids like both of those. But, I mean, even when I was like re-watching it, I was like, yeah, it's pretty cheesy. I understand that. <laughs> You know, it's like it's it holds up for me better than like ET, which I think, like I a, a lot of those classics, kind of are, are lackluster now. Yeah, yeah. We were watching ET the other week. It still grabs at your emotional strings pretty good, but mm. yeah, I don't know. It's no Jaws. No, it's not. It's not. Jaws is a, 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 just a masterpiece. Yeah. So um, I, I saw, I was talking to Brendan just quickly. He got it. Yes. Man, I was, I was. Uh, Did you know he had it when he was like in the midst of it? Yes. But I mean, like it was never, it's still presumptive. Like, I mean, he, he told like, me his symptoms and I thought like, oh, that sounds like it's absolutely. Yeah, I, my, my fear is that that's the case with a lot of people because, well, in my country, testing is not readily available. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I have a friend who her and her son are pretty much sure they have it, but they won't test them because they didn't have fevers. Yeah, you basically have to be like ready to be hospitalized before you can yeah. get testing, right? Uh, I don't think anyone's testing where we are either, really. Um, I think it's basically the same thing. Like if you're extremely sick, there's a number you can call, and if you sound like you're about to, you know, stop breathing, then they'll admit you for testing and hospitalization. Yeah, I think it's the same here. So it just makes me like when we see those numbers like that they're putting out, I'm like, it's definitely so much higher than that. The numbers are insane. Like I, I can't believe. Um, no, I can't either. And but the thing is, it's higher than what we're seeing because. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I need, Brendan's in Brooklyn, so like, I don't know, I mean, you know, he's like, like ground zero for uh, right, that's a virus right. in, in the States, so I don't know how he can track, like, he, he doesn't go anywhere, so I don't know how he managed to yeah, get this thing. Yeah, he said he was super, super careful too, which yeah. I don't believe. I just think it's so easy to catch. Like, yeah. I think that's the problem with it. I mean, the people that are still like, I don't get what the problem is. I, I'm like, I, then I don't know what to tell you because it's everywhere. Yeah. If I stay reopening, I just, I, I can't comprehend that. Sean was a bad guy. He said yes. Oh, I say yes to him. Yeah, I don't, I don't envy you. Like the the media over there is, uh, is kind of a, kind of an, in, kind of insane. So. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you know, I mean, this. Yeah, this, my, this country is a tricky place to be living right now. Just for your own sanity, it's tricky. I gotta close this door again. So, have you have you stopped working on Isola? Pardon, sir. Have you stopped working on Isola? Well, we had to because we um, because Brendan was uh, too sick to work on it. But just right. since he's been back up and about at the uh, at his desk, we've been uh, having kind of daily writing sessions where we're breaking uh, breaking down the third volume right now. Right. So once we do that, I can start start drawing. But uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know what this means for our schedule. Like we basically don't have one. No. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, who knows what's going to happen? Distribution and publishing for near future. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's going to be interesting to see like what happens now. It's like a, I, I heard on a podcast that Patreon's um, Patreon's I think average subscriber and average uh, patron count is up like thirty something percent, oh, which really? is huge. Like there's a gold rush for um, you know um, kind of like indie crowdfunding, basically solutions to. Uh, to uh, like the retail problem. Yeah, it's made me really want to, I mean, I'm not doing much in comics, but I'm trying to figure out where I want to go with the comics. I, I always want to do them. Um, and I'm just thinking more and more about like a digital distribution platform, mm. um, which I was really resistant to for a while. Because of uh, what? Just because you? I, I don't mind reading on. But like I feel like like webtoon, for example. I feel like that's somewhere between comics and animation. It's not. It's not really what I think of when I think of it as like what comic book storytelling is. Mm -hmm. it's different. It's more. It's more poetic. Some people are doing a very strict panel to panel thing. Some aren't. So. It, it's like the infinite scroll to me. I didn't, it didn't register with me. I, I mean, part of that is I'm just so used to thinking like a, of a 
unit of story being measured as a page. Yeah. And, you know, after reading some, I'm like, all right, a unit of story can be measured as a chapter. That, that's okay. So I think it, it was just, it felt different. And um, I don't know. I think at first I just was like, uh, I was so locked in on like printed books. Mm -hmm. which I do love and I guess like ultimately I'm like it would be nice to put out like chapters on a like on a some sort of digital platform and then maybe collect those chapters into a single volume but make it a really really pretty book like really well designed what good materials like something that you really like to hold in your hands yeah, I, th I think, well, people are doing that now, like, uh, pretty successfully. Um, They're doing what? Well, basically producing, well, they don't even do the digital content. They just basically crowdfund a, a book and then um, kickstart it and do stretch goals to make it as, as nice a product as, as possible. Well, that's, that's interesting. Who have you seen do that? Do you know, pop your head, do you remember? Um, Doug Tenaples do it. He's done a bunch of them now. Oh, okay. Um, he's done a lot of, uh, well, I think he did an Earthworm Jim thing and he's done uh, like a couple of original things. But um, I think those are all just, like he basically writes them and then he crowdfunds them. I don't know. It's a, uh, as far as models go, like it's, I don't know. I, I, I like, I like the idea of, um, Maybe just because I came from like kind of like an early web comics sort of time. Like I like the idea of putting stuff up for free and then building an audience that way. Who yeah, will so like support that. Thing. I'm starting to like that. Like I'm just thinking more and more about actually trying to do something at Webtoon for my first approach. Ultimately, I am really thinking about trying to create comics for the phone mm -hmm. which is different than webtoon in my eyes is it isn't that basically the strength of webtoon well i still don't see that that the webtoon like the way i want to do it and it, like webtoon works on a phone but i still am not seeing it designed for the phone oh. like in terms of the artist doing it like I think of the phone as such a small reading space. Mm -hmm. Some of the comics I've read, I'm like, that would be hard to read on a phone because I'm reading them on my desktop. Yeah. Um, but I would still like to have like a screen be sold as a as a unit of space, of narrative space, much like a page, mm -hmm. and not have an infinite scroll. I'm curious about playing with that a little bit. Yeah, the infinite scroll thing, I mean, I get it, but it's not, it's not something that I'd want to even really experiment with. I mean, I think some I, people I, do well. I did uh, a couple of small jobs with it. One for Riot Games and another one, um, oh, for uh, the Axel's new company, AWA. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's different. Uh, when you have like a strong editorial presence, I had to work digitally because they're, you're, they're changing so much and, and they're wanting to do so much with like the platform of the infinite scroll that I just lost the joy in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was like, it just had to be digital to go along with like everything they kept wanting to add and do to it. Yeah, you basically have to work in layers. Like it's just like a, right. And it just I feels like a production job. Right, exactly, and and that's when I was like, I don't want to do that. Yeah, I mean, I kind of do that anyway. Like most of my stuff is, but just for my own ease of use or for Michelle's to just have stuff easily separated in layers. But uh, uh, if you're trying to, you know read another publisher's mind to do that it's it's another thing like i've done done some jobs like that too where oh i mean i think andy just the thing he just did was a lot of that like uh basically rigging puppets you know like right right 
Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, I've done that before too. Uh, I don't know. So, do you work traditional at all anymore? You, you're, you've been working digital for a long time, right? It's been a while. Yeah, like hard, hardly at all. Um, like, uh, you know, if I do the odd commission, um, I'll do it traditionally, of course. But uh, is it that you just like digital that much better? Uh, it's that you know what it is it's that like like i'm not that interested in drawing <laughs> like a ever like i basically i'm interested in making stuff um and this is the most expedient way to make a thing and get it out there like it's not i don't know like, what do you mean you're not interested in draw like you draw so well what, what do you mean you're not interested in drawing I mean, I don't, I don't know. I haven't drawn for pleasure in a long time. Like I take pleasure in, for example, these, these pages I'm doing of this, uh, this short story, like they're, I'm having a lot of fun doing it. Like it, there's a ton of pleasure involved in that, but the pleasure comes from successfully executing a thing that's in my head and getting it down on the page. Like there's not a ton of pleasure in actually sitting down and, and, drawing it in a tactile way so right. if if i can do that you know if i can do the bulk of it digitally and more expediently then then um so you do, yeah you just want to whatever is the, the quickest means to get it to where you want it to be yeah pretty much gotcha i understand yeah. that it's certainly not uh a quick way that i work working traditionally yeah, I can't, it's a weird thing. Like I can't remember, like I was a kid when I did a lot of drawing as a kid and, and really enjoyed just the act. But even then, if I'm honest about it, like, no, oh, that needs to be on. No. Um, um, oh, thanks. Okay, <laughs> you got a light on it. Uh, even that was like, the pleasure in it was was about being able to look at something and reproduce it. You know, it wasn't about, you know, just putting lines on a page. You mean reproduce like another piece of artwork? Yeah, like, like, oh, I love this piece of artwork or these characters and I want to see if I can draw it. Like, uh, can I, can I, even now I'm kind of like that. I'm like, I like this style of thing. Can I, can I replicate that or do it? And then once I can, like, I take a lot of pleasure in the act of learning it and trying to apply it and do it. And then once I've done it, I'm like, okay, and I've done that. <laughs> like I mean, that'll I'll, I'll just, I kind of like try to absorb that and make it part of my you know my my work overall. But um, I but I don't sit and doodle or anything. Like I don't you know. Huh. It, it, but that's not because of time. That's choice. You're saying that's choice. Yeah. Like there's a hundred other things I'd rather do than sit and draw. Like what would you rather do? What do you like? Like, what do you do for fun? Um, I like, um, well, I went through a phase where I was just kind of learning to code. Okay. Code stuff, like just playing with game design. I like, I've spent like hours like just kind of mulling over that stuff. Um, like building, like modeling things I like to do, like uh, reading, just writing sometimes. I'll just... So it's all based around being creative. Yeah, it's all creative stuff. It's all it's all stuff that occupies like a giant portion of my brain creatively. Like I'll just wander around or go for runs and like I'm always processing something. Um, but uh, yeah, like it's a very little bit. It has to do with uh, with drawing. Like the drawing is just like I'm I'm kind of relieved that I can I can do it to the extent that like I can usually get down on paper something resembling what's in my head. Um, but I don't do a lot of like, I don't practice it a lot, which is kind of, kind of, uh, I'm sort of ashamed of. But you do draw all day, every day. So you are getting practice, right? Yeah. I mean, there's a practice of like, but I mean, I could be, there's definitely muscles I could be stretching, you know? Right. right. Um, like I, I'll, re, I'll rely on a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff that I already know in order to, just, just get stuff done. So in your day-to-day -day life, when you're looking around, you don't 
do you get that feeling like when you see something like, ooh, I got to draw that? No, never. But I will, I will take, I will see stuff all the time and think, oh, that would be an amazing story component or, or like a good launch pad for an idea or right. something. Um, like the drawing of the thing is like, is work for me. Is that, is that new or that's always been that way? I think it's always been that way. Like I, I started, like when I started, when I first got into, I decided I wanted to make comics. I was probably like 16 or 17 and I started doing submission stuff. And I, and I loved doing that. Uh, I loved sitting at the table and drawing that stuff. And I think it's because I, I do love the medium, but also it's because I was learning a craft. Like I was trying to learn and master a craft. And then once that turned into um, like jobs and deadlines, it was, you know, then it was a job Then it was like, oh, like how much do I really like this? <laughs> do I, do well, I really, right, right. really want to be doing this? Right. Uh, but I think that, I mean, I went through that too, where like, you're just, you have to work so much, so many hours and so hard to maintain these schedules that the joy just gets zapped out of it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, for me, that was like, I, I don't want to live like this where I, I've just turned art into a desk job. And yeah. you know, the reason I wanted to do art for a living was one of the reasons was to not have to do that. So well, that so, so then, okay, if, if money was no object, like if, if you, you know, if you were just totally like self-sufficient financially, um, what would you be doing? Would you be making draw, comics? Or making my comics. It would be comics. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'd be drawing a lot and painting and doing all that, but I'd definitely be making comics. Hmm. What about you? I think the same. And I, I don't know, like I haven't, like I kind of want to meditate on it or something because I don't know. Part of me doesn't know what my relationship, my honest relationship to comics is. Like, I think it's just, I think it's just the most expedient way to get ideas into a form that other people can consume you know what i mean like it's it's just so much easier than making a film <laughs> right right something else i, I um i mean I, what i i for me it's all about i i i love the idea of having of telling stories mm -hmm. um but what i love about comics as opposed to film and other medium media is there's very little filter between your vision in an ideal situation between your and the viewer. So cool. but i think drawings bring something to the table that i i don't think other mediums do and that's probably because i'm an artist and i love drawing but i always love seeing you know like hellboy mm -hmm. I, I those are fun to read i don't think they're the most incredible written comics, but you add Mike Mignola's art and it takes me to a place when I'm reading it that I've never been. Yeah. And I yeah. love that element of it. And that's part of like, that's part of just the, uh, someone's, someone's vision, um, right. uh, like as, as a line or as a series of lines. You know, like it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I would also just be making comments. I mean, I guess that's clear. Like, I, I, I have some free time now. And all I want to do is work on this. Yeah, make this comic. Um, I mean, so, my, yeah. my struggle right now is to figure out how to make a living outside of doing comics so that I can do the comics I want to do. Mm -hmm. Well, but don't, like, isn't there a, a way, like, could you, could you just do what you want to be doing, um, in like a, you know, not like a crowd, with a crowdfunding model? I no, I mean, it's possible. I haven't had success on those levels that have made me feel confident I could do that. Mm -hmm. Like even like my Kickstarter for my new art book, I just had it made its goal, but it didn't do great. I couldn't survive off that kind of money. Yeah. Whereas like I see other Kickstarters do so incredible. I'm like, well, if I could make that kind of money, yeah. But 
if I crowdfunded a comic, I, I wouldn't be able to survive. Yeah, Andy and I talk about this a lot. Like he were because he was he's been trying to work on that mother trucker thing for a while, but just hasn't had. But like basically, can't work on it unless he's being paid, right? Like he just doesn't have the the bandwidth to do that. Right. So Got to be right. making money. Um. So we're, we've been talking a lot about how to, you know, how how he could manage it, and that's why I think why he he's decided to go the, the issue route because like it's one thing to he can produce like 32 pages or whatever of something um for you know without any income ahead of time and, and kickstart it but if he was gonna you know like write an original graph like do like 200 or so pages of something like it's not yeah mm -hmm. yeah there, there's a model in there that, that can work i mean for me i guess what i'm trying to figure out right now is like if I rely on comics as my sole source of income, I go down, like I just go under, I'm drowning. So I have to have a model where I can do other things that will allow me to make more money and still allow me time to produce, but certainly not on any type of schedule that's like monthly or anything like that. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm trying to navigate all that right now. Do you think you'll teach again? Um, well, one thing I am doing is, I, I mean, I'm putting my teaching to use um, right before this virus hit, I was supposed to shoot my first, like I'm making a series of um, like either downloadable or streaming instructional videos. Mm -hmm. And it's a new branch of my business. I'm just calling Ink Pulp Instruction. So I'll be teaching on my terms and it'll I'll be like the money I make will be direct sales. Uh, so that, that that's, and that will also create a stream of passive income for me that will allow me to do things. So that's a big one. And, and that's something I want to grow to where it's not just me, but I want to produce videos for as many comic book artists or as I know and are wanting to do it. Mm -hmm. so, it's kind of like a master class. Like, yes, exactly. And I want to have as a part of it, like an interview very much like my podcast has been, mm -hmm. but it'll be filmed and it'll be included in it. So, I mean, like I look at John Favreau's chef show mm -hmm. and that's like the model I see in my head where I want to do that for some instructional art stuff, but make it entertaining too. Yeah. There's a lot of production involved in that too, though, right? Like, I guess. Yeah, I guess maybe... I have, the guy who does my audio for my podcast, um, like right now, he's doing like these video podcasts, and he's it's allowed him to experiment with creating some motion graphics and some editing with the uh, like the intro sequence and stuff like that, and all that is experimenting and training us for when we make our first video. Mm -hmm. part of that team it'll be me and him but do i want to go back and teach at a university now that, that's just a that's bureaucracy and nonsense that i, I have no time or interest from mm -hmm. and that will mm -hmm. just take away from my time and ability to create which is what happened yeah and why i couldn't sustain it anymore I mean, it would be different if it were like the 70s, because I think colleges at that time were very different. and They wanted their teachers to be published in whatever field they were working in. So they gave them things called course releases and basically paid them to spend time working on their their own work. And they just don't yeah. do anymore. When was the last time you did that? You were at, at SCAD for... Um, yeah, I, um, me and my buddy built the sequential art department at SCAD Atlanta, and I ended up teaching and then running the department, and I mean, we developed it together based on what Savannah was doing, but tweaked it quite a bit, too. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was there for a good 10 years. I put a lot of myself into it. It was like a big 
project for me. Uh, but ultimately the corporate machine just steps in and it, they ruin everything you enjoy about it. Yeah. I've heard a lot of like, uh, weirdly, like every time I hear someone being interviewed um, and they mention that they were like, uh, like, SCAD, like SCAD alumni or whatever, um, or involved in any way, they're always kind of like biting their tongue about something. <laughs> yeah, well, dude, I'll speak freely about it. It's, it's, a, it's a really horrible place in a lot of ways. Um, it's, it's run by this maniacal, greedy woman She's, I mean, I, I really, like, when I see, like, what Donald Trump does, she's like him. Like, in, in the way, everything's a show. Like, the entire university is about this show they want to put on for the public. Like, what does it look like? What are the catalogs like? What is the website like? What guests do we have? So it's all about putting on this show, and it's very little about the quality of the classroom to the point where, like, even, like, right now, Everyone has to teach exactly the same information. They, have, they won't uh, tolerate or allow anyone bringing their independent expertise to the classroom. Every, everyone has to be a disposable cog in this machine that per, makes her money, which is really what it is. Mm. I mean, like, we didn't get paid great there. She was giving herself millions of dollars in bonuses. And um, there's a lot of corruption there, a lot. And they, they sweep it under, under the table. And when people go online about it, they harass and bully them. Or oh, it sounds like a cult. Them. Yeah, it, it has that feeling. And, and when you visit, like, I mean, there, it does feel like that. Mm. And there's like this, I went back because last year I kind of hit bottom. And I, I was like, I think I can go back to teaching. I, I don't think I can sustain living like this anymore. And I went back and I started interviewing. But when I went back on campus to give like a guest lecture, I saw people I worked with for a decade. And one guy I, I knew, and I, I think he saw me and came up to me, he had this like glazed over look. And he was like, what are you doing here? Like, it was like, you were out there. You got out. <laughs> Yeah, it's exactly the feeling I got from him. And oh. it had become much worse since I left, I found out. And um, it, it, you have to, while the, peop, the teachers there, most of them don't buy into the cult. They have to put on the, the show that they do. And they have to pretend they do on a daily basis. Like, I remember, like, we'd be, I'd get to the school and I'd be setting up to go teach and you get an email that the president's gonna be walking around today. So whatever your plans were for the, your class today, now we have to change that because we have to put on a show for her. Mm. And it was just shit like that. I was like, that has nothing to do with why I'm teaching. Like, What about the, the student experience? Like, do people um, come out I, of there satisfied or? My goal when I was teaching there was, I, I knew all this going in because I got my master's degree there. So I knew all about it. Hold on, I need to take a sip of water. So I knew all this going in. And my goal there was regardless of the cost, because the cost is insane for tuition. I think right now, if you were to go to SCAD for a four year degree, you're looking at, I think it's like three hundred thousand dollars. Whoa! For an art degree that you'll never be able to pay back working in the arts. Mm -hmm. So I knew that, and I was like, and I would tell my students the first day, I was like, "There's really no logical reason you're here studying to do comics at all." And I know because I, I did the same thing myself. But the reason you're here is passion, and if if you're really here to learn how to do this, and you're passionate enough about this, I am here to, to teach you and make this the best experience possible. And so I put this requirement forth in my department that everyone who's teaching with me 
in my department be a published professional. That was like the base. If you didn't have that, I, I wouldn't even consider you for the department. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted my students to learn from professionals and um, I worked really hard. And so I can confidently say that while I was there, the students that were in my department and the faculty we had, they got a kick-ass education. Now it weeded out a bunch of people who are really angry at the experience because they were just kind of like kids of rich parents who didn't know what they were going to do with their life. And they're like, well, I like playing video games and I like reading comics. So I'll go do this. And so, I mean, we, we designed the, the program to kind of like be so hard and so difficult that it would weed those out. Cause if you're really passionate about making comics, the difficulty of what we were asking was just to draw a fuck ton and work a lot mm -hmm. on comics. So, it did make it hard for students who had no business being there, but it was designed like that to try to save them and not waste anyone's time. So there's a lot of my students from when I was teaching, when I was running the department, a lot of the students of that era are working in comics professionally now. Well, that's so great. I, that, but that also became a big bone of contention with Savannah because they weren't working professionally, most of them, and the ones that were didn't really last long there because SCAD has a very low tolerance for people becoming successful outside of teaching. And that's ultimately what happened with me. But- um, Well, did they encourage your leaving because you were- No, they, they, like, I was starting to, like I got an exclusive contract at Marvel and I was working, I was running that department I'm working for Marvel full time, and I, I was just like working incessantly on every level, and I was using the success I was having in comics to bring attention to what I was doing in teaching, into the program I was teaching, and into the school I was teaching for. Mm -hmm. And for a little while, it was like something that they were really enjoying, and then ultimately. It just became something that I guess they saw as threatening because it's clear now that they want to control the classroom from the administrative level. And it's just not a way to teach art. Mm -hmm. So that became an issue. So will, are the students getting a quality education? I can say in the Atlanta sequential art department, I, I back that because I my buddy who I opened and built the program with is they're running it now and I trust in him and what they're doing. But and with the Atlanta campus, I don't know about now, but when I was there, that was pretty standard throughout the departments because when they opened up in Atlanta, they recruited professionals in every area. So I don't know if that standard is still there, but it was. Hmm. Um, Savannah, I, I mean as far as learning how to do comics in Savannah, I, I think that is a, it's an absolute waste of money. You will learn just as much sitting at home and doing just as much work in yeah. conventions. Interesting. So yeah, that was a long winded. No, answer. it's, a, it's a big, I, something I've just been curious about for a long time because I've always heard allusions to uh, yeah so the students that go there they, they do get keyed in on a lot of the, the shadiness of what's going on at the school um, and so they become aware of it I don't know why they're afraid to speak out about it but mm. you know, I mean they you do develop close relationships with the teachers so they probably don't want to hurt their teachers yeah but um, yeah, I mean, I just, art school in general, I, I find is a tricky means. It's something like Klaus Jansen and I had a, a big talk about it because we talk about it a lot, actually, because he's still teaching at SVA in New York and he loves teaching and I love teaching. I really did enjoy the act of teaching and being a teacher. And after that thing with SCAD where I was going to go back and then I, I withdrew my application ultimately because I was just like, I can't do this. I'm going to be miserable. 
So that's when I was like, all right, but I do want to teach. What can I do? And that's when I came up with the idea to create this series of um, like a of an instructional downloadable or streaming videos that um, I mean, my goal is you can learn how to do comics from all the best people in comics and get an entire education for, you know, if, if each video is like 20 to 40 bucks and even if you do a hundred of them, you're talking about $2,000 to yeah. get an entire education and a hundred videos, that's a lot of information. So that's my goal is to allow it much more accessible to learn and not pay a fortune. Well, that would be great. I'd love to see it, to see that come together. Yeah, it is, it is. I mean, I've got the first one. We've, I've got it all written, like what I'm gonna do. I'm working on the, the, uh, the drawings I need to do that we're gonna film of me inking them. I've got other artists that I know that I've spoken to who are interested in doing one. Um, and I'm just going to be talking to everyone I know, people like you and Andy too, to see if you ever want to do one. Because I've got a business model for it too, where um, my hope is also for us, it's an opportunity for everyone to make some decent money on the side. If you do a video once, then if this catches on, every month you're going to get a check or a direct deposit of, you know, a decent amount of money. Mm -hmm. So that's the hope. Did you ever, I mean, being around in Atlanta, um, were you aware of what was going on with CrossGen at the time? Uh, I, w I was in Savannah when CrossGen happened. That was down in Florida. Oh, was it? I thought, okay. No, it was outside of Orlando. So I knew about it because I was in grad school at the time at SCAD. And, you know, I, re I remember when they were just getting started, like before they announced anything, I was at Megacon in Orlando and I was hanging out with like Andrew Robinson and, and uh, like he was at um, Jolly Rogers studio at the time and I was hanging out with the Gaijin guys. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, me and my buddies were still trying to break in, but we had spent a lot of time at these studios and knew these guys. And there was a rumor that there was this, these people from a company uh, and this guy was here. What was the guy's name? The owner? Do you remember? Oh, um, shoot. Who was it? I don't remember. Mark Alessi, right? Yes, yes, that's right. Okay, yeah. that's what it was. Yeah. So there were rumors that this guy was here and he was starting a company and people were going to be put on salary to draw comics and they were going to receive benefits and they were going to pay people to move and it was all going to be done in-house in this new studio. And so we all started to see this Alessi guy at the show like hanging out at night with cigars, buying drinks for everyone. And he was putting on this big show of being Mr. Moneybags. And that was right as they were getting started. And I remember like a lot of people were like, I want to go over there. Well, I, I was aware of it. I mean, I was aware of the, the publisher, but, I, um, but mostly of the conditions of it, uh, just because I knew like, um, I met Scotty Young and Josh Middleton around that time. And I think Middleton went out there. I think he. I think you're right. Uh, and I remember him telling me about <laughs> the horrible work experience of uh, going into that office all the time, and like the, just yeah. the, just the quality. Just described the quality of the the grass and everything. Just made it sound like the worst possible environment. I I saw Scotty just drew um, some characters from your your. Uh, Web comic, yeah, he drew them ages ago. Uh, they were up on uh, right. as a guest strip for me, yeah, but he right. yeah, them. exactly, exactly. So, uh, but I didn't realize you guys were good friends, yeah. Well, we, we, yeah, we've known each other forever now. Uh, we hard we see each other at the occasional convention, um, but that's about it. But, like, uh, I don't know, I just he, he's always felt kind of like a kind of like a brother. You know, his first work in Marvel was was doing um, a fill-in issue for a miniseries I was doing. 
It was oh, like a, really? an Iceman miniseries. Yeah. So yeah, I, I yeah, I was aware of aware of him because of that. And then we just met at a show and we just hung out. Like I hung out with him and Josh a few times at different shows. And uh, I just really love him. And he's like a he's like a very yeah. really good friend. But I I see him so rarely. Right. Yeah. He's a uh, just such a like a big explosion of happiness. Mm hmm. Yeah, always super. It's you know what's thrilling is seeing him. The stuff he's doing now, um, he he talked about years ago at shows like the um, like the right. different ideas for like the bully story. I remember him pitching us that in San Diego like in two thousand and five or something. I don't know. It was a long time ago. Oh shit! I didn't know that. Yeah, so it's nice to see that stuff kind of coming to fruition. Yeah. Ah, Papa. My eye. What happened? Oh, you lost an eye? <laughs> <laughs> so is this your normal work day, Carl? You got kids coming in and out all day? This is way more work time than I usually have. <laughs> like oh, I set aside time to hang out with you and 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 do this, but uh, okay. usually usually there's a lot. It's uh, Andy had to leave. Usually it's broken up a lot. Like my wife and I will split up. The day like one of us will take the morning uh to work and the other will uh just kind of hang with the kids and try to do some homeschooling okay and so a lot of my time is like i'll work for a while and then i'll like have to stop and we'll just go outside and do some stuff or play something or build something and then and back. like most of my actual productive time happens after they're in bed oh do you, do you work late at night i don't like to but like if i want to get anything done now i have to yeah, I mean, that's honestly why we got a studio outside the house. It was just getting too hard yeah. to work inside. That's yeah. when we were really young. How old are your kids? My daughter is 17. She's, I mean, what sucks about this virus thing is she lost her, like, graduation, like, her senior year. Oh, man. Yeah. Um, and uh, my son is 14. Yeah, so that's a very different... Experience. Yeah, very different. Yeah. yeah, but when they were, I think my son was two and my daughter was like five. I remember I was like working on an issue at Deadpool and I, my studio was in my bedroom. Yeah. I drove my wife crazy because I'd be up late working. And I did that like when I was a kid. When I first started, I think I was like 18 or 19. And so I just worked I was at my parents' house for the first bunch of years and I worked. You know, I had a drawing table in my bedroom, and it was horrible for actually getting anything done. Yeah. You, know, like, you just, like, live with the guilt of having this thing beside your bed. Yes, yes. Yeah. I couldn't separate my, um, yeah. like, my home life from work at all. Yeah. Not, I, I couldn't until I moved out to a studio. Yeah, that's what happened. But I, I remember I was trying to ink Deadpool and, like, my daughter wanted to watch, so she had put her head right between my oh. face and the table, so I couldn't see anything. And my son was climbing up my back. I was like, I just can't get anything done like this. Yeah. But you know, then I liked it. I liked I, it allowed me to separate it from home a lot, which I really enjoyed. So where are you right now? In a home studio? No, I'm in I'm in a studio. It's outside the house. It's very close to my house. I, I rent an office in this building, but nobody else is is coming in these days. There's it's a building of about twenty offices, and I think only three of them are actually rented. And out of those three, I'm the only one coming in. Oh, but I love it. It's it's a great space. It has a whole kitchen with like a Keurig coffee maker and all kinds of amenities here it's, it's great i've done a whole like a complete 180 on my coffee production though like uh we were given like an espresso machine as a gift a few years a bunch oh of years my ago God, I want one of those. well yeah so i went through this phase where like like my in-laws gave us this espresso machine and we tried it and we we're like this is great and they're sending us recycling bags so i don't feel guilty like i can recycle these capsules Right. Um, and then like, and then I went to, uh, we, that was like, like 
two, three years of that, and I had like I would order these capsules with my was espresso it account. Nespresso? It was Nespresso, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Those are good machines. Yeah. They're they're good and the coffee's good and there's like a just like a nice like a consistency to it, like when you find something you really like. Yeah. You know what you're getting. And then we lived in Japan for the year and I didn't have that. And so I just bought like a stovetop, um, you know, like the little mocha pot stovetop. Right. Espresso maker. And um and I just, I love it. Like I just fell in love with it. And now I came, I came back and I just, I gave away that Nespresso machine and I just make this, it's just a nice ritual to yeah, make this little like grind that. like coffee and make it in the morning. Yeah. I love those little, those things you're, you're using, those little espresso makers. I, I don't, I don't use the Keurig downstairs hardly ever, but when I need it, it's nice to know it's there, but I, I wish I had, I mean, there's no stove here, so I don't have that option, but I, I don't, I would be okay with an espresso maker, but what I'd really like is an actual espresso machine. Mm, yeah. That would yeah. be really nice. Like, I, I think don't they're like really expensive. The pods just for the recycling reasons. I agree yeah. on that. Yeah. But you could probably find like a Craigslist or whatever for special espresso machine. Yeah. I, I mean, even for home, I'd much rather have that than the drip machine we've been using. I find the drip like if I drink drip coffee, it I I get uncomfortably wired, like it's it's horrible. Oh really? Yeah, like drip coffee really just get, hits my system and and messes me up. Yeah, I'm very sensitive to caffeine, so I wonder. Oh, huh, yeah, maybe I need to switch off that. But I would love a good espresso maker at home. I'm just riffing on this now. Like I basically did this outline and now I'm just kind of making up. Yeah, you riff away. Yeah. I'm getting uh, close to finish. I probably have 10, 15 minutes and I'll be done. Yeah. Well, we'll, we, we'll call it then. Whenever you're done, we'll. Uh, yeah, I'm going to, when I'm done, I want to come over and see what you're doing. I'm actually going to change my studio up next week because I actually I haven't told you this. I haven't talked about it too much. So I'm doing this job. Do you, you have some rap music at all? Not a, not that oh, much. Right? In our, in our last podcast. Yeah, we talked about it. Yeah, it was never really, I, mean, I like it, but it was never my thing. So not to the extent that you. There's you know. a rap band that, that came out in the mid 90s that I just love, and they're called The Far Side. Mm -hmm. And um, they reached out to me. Like I did a, a Marvel hip hop variant. They were like, they gave me a list to choose from and I saw the Far Side's first record was on that list. So I chose that. And that kind of like, we started talking a little bit after that. You and were, the actual band? Yeah, yeah, me and the actual band. Oh, cool. So, um, and then like I'd say last <laughs> time, the manager reached out to me. He was like, hey, uh, I, I, I got something that the far side wants to work with people. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. And then I didn't hear anything. And then he'd get back to me and be like, don't worry, man, it's, it's coming. Okay. And then that just kind of evaporated. Can you Actual band request. So, so you're, so it's not through a publisher now, you're just working directly with them? Okay. Yeah, but it's not a comic. It's uh, I'm I can't say too much. I'll tell you off camera like what it is, but it's not a comic. It's something that it's like something for them, but we're doing it together. So, um, yeah. but they have a uh, internet network called Farside TV, mm -hmm. and they um, last week were really coming at me hard about putting my podcast up on it. Oh, so huh. I'm gonna be doing that, and that's part of the reason I, I changed. I like I created a new YouTube channel, and I'm changing everything over to it right now. Yeah, I just saw that this morning. Yeah, I just wanted the branding to be consistent because I've always wanted to grow this podcast, and now I feel like I actually see how to do it. I didn't know what I was going to do before, and now I actually have like a vision of what it's going to be. So. Mm -hmm. That was about. So um, I forget the point of all this, but that's that's happening. So 
I'm going to be making some video promos next week that will start airing in the next mm-hmm. week. And eventually, uh, I'll be releasing the podcast there, premiering it there, but then the day after, I'll be putting it up on my YouTube channel and my audio outlets, too. Cool. None of this surprises me, I guess. Like, like one of the things that I think I, I envy uh, about you, or I think you're great at, is just is just connecting with people. You know, like you're just really good at networking, and not in a not in a not in a cynical bullshit way, but in like a legitimate right. like. You find people who inspire you, and you you and you connect with them, which is something that's that may seem easy. I don't know if it does, but it's, it's, it's not like, it's not something that'd be, that'd be easy for me. And it's a, I think it's a real gift. Oh, thank you. You know, I appreciate you saying that. And I think you're, you're right. I mean, my podcast made it very clear to me that I, I do have a, like a very natural ability to connect with people, not in a, like it's a genuine conversation and connection I have when I talk to people. Mm-hmm. And it's not like marketing to get a job or networking to get a job. It's just connecting. So I agree. I, I just, I haven't been able to use that to my financial gain in any way, shape or form over the years. And I think that's starting to change, but it's always, I think it, it, it will work because it's genuine. So that's my hope. Yeah. It may be just the kind of thing you cannot orchestrate. Like it, it will just reap its own right words in the right. future. So like the far side coming to me and that like that was all, I didn't, I mean, some might say I made that opportunity happen because I connected with them, but mm-hmm. I had nothing to do with it. They, they just offered it up. Mm-hmm. I guess they, they listened to it and liked it. And, and then they're creative people and they, I love, they, I like, like since working with them, I'm like, these are good dudes. That's good. It's nice to, to we'll see where that goes. They say don't meet your heroes, right? <laughs> yeah, nice, I mean nice that this worked out. We've all met some that were disappointing, but we've all met some that were cool too. Mm-hmm. You, you don't have to say who, but have you ever met like someone like a hero of yours and be like, what an ass? I uh, yes. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yes. Oh well. I mean, when I first, and my, I'm, and since then, my opinion of them may have, uh, may have changed. But like in initially, I remember like, like um, taking my work around to people at an early age and uh, at shows and just having people be kind of, kind of dicks. Um, yeah, I mean, and then like meeting them later, like fifteen years later, and they're like totally fine. It's just that. You know, some people are not good with critiques. Who knows what the hell, like, you know, what conventions well, are like. That's true. But I also think some people, like, when when you're working or when your work is of a professional level, like, later in life, like, people, some people just treat you differently. And that, I think, is scummy. Like, just be good to everyone. You don't know who's going to develop into something. But I think it says something about someone's character when they're shitty to someone who's like trying to get started yeah i think the worst is uh the worst kind of convention behavior from professionals when you're approaching someone at a table is when they're constantly looking around at uh for someone more (laughs) important yes oh my god the worst Yeah, it's a it's a tricky business because there's so much of that, like networking and who you know shit. I guess like being with Essential Sequential must have must ease the the burden of convention going quite a lot. Oh my God, yes, yes. I mean, it's I, I'm very lucky, very 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 lucky. Uh, Jason's great. I trust him a hundred percent. He does a great job. But when I go to a convention, I just have to bring whatever I need to work on commissions with a pad of paper, a bottle of ink, and some brushes and some pencils. 
because the banner, the artwork, he brings it all, he sets it all up, he breaks it all down, all the sales throughout the day. Uh, he has a team of people there that are taking all the orders and fielding all the questions. Mm -hmm. And you just come and go, like when it's lunchtime, I kind of realized how spoiled I am because at lunchtime, like me and Mateo and Eric will like leave and go out for lunch. Yeah. To get away from the con, have a beer and relax and take a good hour, hour and a half to have a lunch and get away from the noise and the crowds. And we don't have to worry about anything because people are at our table and they're selling our stuff and everything's looked after. Mm -hmm. But I noticed like as I would ask, like, hey, you want to go to lunch with us? They're like, I can't. I got my table. I'm like, oh, right. So, yeah, it, it does make the conventions a lot more pleasant. Yeah, it's, I haven't done a lot of conventions uh, in the last few years. Um, Why is, is there a reason for that? Well, I stopped doing them um, when I started, when I had kids. I just stopped going regularly. And um, yeah. and then I just, you know, kind of got in the habit of not, not do, also like for me, and, I, and this is my fault, but but the, the return on investment was just not great. You know, like it was barely worth it to, to put the effort into these things because I wasn't uh, either I didn't have stuff coming out regularly or stuff to to sell or I just didn't I never put a lot of effort into my actual table presence uh, yeah. but at the last New York show I guess last year uh, we went and we Brendan and Michelle and I went and we actually made a very focused effort like I just uh, thought I just had enough of myself <laughs> like I was like like I got to do this properly like I can't just go and and like plunk my crap down and sit there like a right like so we actually designed a, like a, a table and, oh, um, and like figured out some like stuff like merch to bring and like just just put some effort into it yeah so, so and it was way better i mean like financially right. and just and psychologically it was just a nicer experience so i could see doing more you know a few shows here and there with it with that in mind yeah yeah i hope so i mean for me one of the big pluses of conventions aside from making some money is i get to spend time with friends and mm -hmm. actually because i don't do anything social at home mm -hmm. like i have my family i go to the studio and i go to the gym and that's about it i mean like i'll go out with my wife and we'll take the kids out but i rarely ever although i'm trying to more just go grab a drink with a friend. But it, yeah. also a lot of my friends are people like you, like you, you live all over the world, you know, email and talk to them on the internet. But as far as getting time together, mm -hmm. that's like the only time. All right, I'm done. You're done? Okay. okay. Mr. Keefer. That's cool. I haven't done any background. Uh background framing it but we can contrast and compare and then you will sign it and come look at yours switch on camera Boom. my ipad sometimes it freezes on me all right i'm coming over here all right let me switch my frame hang on share my screen yeah, yeah, please. There it is. Oh, that's awesome. Can you zoom in on that a little bit, Carl? Oh, dude, that's so cool. It's really fun. I'll send it to you when it's. I'll do a like. I want to. I want to frame this hair up here with the black. But uh, uh huh. Yeah, but, yeah. But yeah. Yeah, please send it to me when you're done, cause I'll um, I'll put it on my uh, 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 like when I promote this, I'll put it along with it. Bury this tooth a little more in the lip. Uh, that's cool. Anyway, that was super fun. Cool. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you, Carl. This was a blast.
Yeah, it was nice just to get to chat with you. For yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. Mm. Well, let's definitely do it again and when Andy can actually get down and draw with us too. Yeah. For sure. That'd be great. All right. So I'm going to available basically anytime. So. I know we all are. So that's cool. That's cool. I'm going to press stop recording, but then you and I can chat for a minute. Okay. All right. So thanks for listening and uh, subscribe on that YouTube channel. Hit that little subscribe button. Uh, leave a comment, like it, do all that magic stuff. And thanks for listening.